Welcome, 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 everybody. Great to have you join us. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's event. My name is Jillian Fortin, and on behalf of Diamond, um, I'm here representing our organization. We are an inclusive digital agency that builds software accessibly by default. I invite you to follow us on social media and subscribe to our email newsletter to stay on top of the amazing events we hold year round, not just on Global Accessibility Awareness Day or GAD. So I'm honored to kick off today's fireside chat in celebration of the 11th annual GAD. For those of you who don't know, it all started with a blog post written by our CEO, Joe Devin, which caught the attention of GAD co-founder, Jenison Ascension, and quickly became a call to action for digital creators all over the world to make their products accessible to all, including people with disabilities. Today, I'm gonna invite Joe to join us on the virtual stage to kick things off as our moderator. So a little bit about Joe. Joe Devin is a serial entrepreneur who has been fostering the growth of the Los Angeles tech ecosystem since 2008. He is the CEO and co-founder of Diamond, as I mentioned a bit earlier, which issues a yearly state of accessibility report. He is also the co-founder and chair of the Global Accessibility Awareness Day Foundation, which runs a yearly GAD pledge, which is a commitment made by open source projects to make accessibility a core value of their project. Welcome, Joe, and take it away. Thank you, Jillian, for that lovely introduction. I am so excited today. We have a star-studded panel, uh, and we're going to start with the Chief Accessibility Officer of Microsoft, Jenny Lay Fleury. She is leading the company's efforts to drive great products, services, and websites that empower people and organizations to achieve more. Jenny founded the Disability Employment Resource Group at Microsoft. She created the Disability Answer Desk, which provides specialist customer support to people with disabilities. They have handled over 1 million calls to date. Welcome, Jenny. Hello there, happy God. Happy GAD, I'm so glad to, to be spending it with you today. I, I, more the other way around, sir. It, it's an honor to be here and uh, an honor to be with a co-founder of something that really drives our community in a big way. Well, thank you. And, and I also wanna thank you for everything that you've done for both GAD as well as accessibility in general, which leads me to my first question. Can you share with us your journey that led to becoming the Chief Accessibility Officer of Microsoft? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I think any journey has, has lots of parts to it. I think the short version, uh, I've had the privilege of being at Microsoft for 17 years. Um, I joined to work on Hotmail in London. So I did not work, you know, come here to work on accessibility. But I very quickly realized that as a deaf, disabled individual, I needed to better advocate for what I needed. And that really led me into the community of disabled employees at Microsoft. Um, and I honestly just spent years learning, listening, stalking, um, and just picking up so much wisdom. Um, and accessibility was the top topic. I, and eventually that led, you know, through a, a myriad of paths, I became the, the chair founder of the disability ERG here at Microsoft, which is now enormous, 22 groups and global across our employee base. I got really into the nerdery uh, and into the technology side and looking at accessibility very holistically. And then seven years ago became the chief accessibility officer and then realized that actually I've been building up to this my entire life. Um, you know, I was working um, as a camp counselor for kids with disabilities going back to my teenage years. So um, it was a real combination of passion meets my work life. Great. And um, how did you first hear of GAD? When did you hear of it and how did you hear of it? Do you remember? Oh my goodness. 
first year. So, I mean, this is our your 11th year, right, Joe? Um, you know, I think it was Jenison. I think it was Jenison who put it on my radar um, and said, look, we're trying to do a thing. Um, and my general approach to anyone who is game on, fill me in, let's go. Um, and so I, I, I remember reading a, the blog and going, ooh, this could be fun. Um, because I do really believe in the principles and the founding, you know, where you came from with this. We need more people to be aware of accessibility from a developer perspective, which clearly is the foundation to everything from a nerdery technology perspective. But I would also, you know, over, over time, I think it's extended to making sure that humans, all of us know about accessibility. Everyone's coming our way. Um, that's just the nature of disability. It is closely correlated with age. It's closely correlated with life-changing events like a pandemic. Um, and we all need to invest our time to understand accessibility and the features available, but also to make sure everything we do is accessible and inclusive. Um, so I love how it's evolved as well. And uh, you know, again, kudos to you and Jenison uh, for the power you put behind it. Well, thank you. And, and what's funny is I'd say that blog post is the only thing I can look back on and actually be happy with my writing, because whether it's something I write or code, I look back at it six months later, and I'm like, who wrote that a horrible thing? I was scared to look at it for years. But finally, I looked back and I'm like, you know what, that kind of held up. And uh, it was it was just luck that Jenison saw it because nobody can say no to Jenison. And I'm not surprised that that's where you first heard about it. So, so absolutely kudos to him. It would never have been like this if not for him. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, t to share with you that I know firsthand, I don't know what exactly your policies are, but I know firsthand that Microsoft is doing a lot of work behind the scenes for accessibility. And one of the things that the large corporations can do that really will make a change that's totally unsung is ask their vendors to make their products accessible. And I've run into more than one vendor that has said that they're trying to sell into Microsoft, but they need to make their products accessible. If they don't do that, they're not going to get in. And it really feels like a powerful message with tremendous impact. Can you speak to that effort at all? I don't know. I don't want to ask you anything that you're not allowed to say, but uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, no, of course. I mean, I think first to just take a step back, you know, our approach and, and what we really instilled uh, back, gosh, beginning of 2016 when we came in and we kind of took this as an opportunity to reshape and you know, create a new chapter for accessibility at Microsoft. And to think about accessibility as an ecosystem, as a culture, as a discipline that everyone needs. I mean, there's 160 plus thousand employees at Microsoft and there's 20,000 suppliers. Um, and these are companies that supply us with goods every single day, whether it's services, products, coding, whatever it may be. And if you're gonna truly live into the principle of an accessible culture and ecosystem, then it can't just be what you produce. It has to be what you consume as well. Um, and so the, yes, the supplier procurement component is very important to us. Um, and that takes multiple forms. Um, you know, on the non-technical side, one of the things we did in 2019 was make sure that our policy was very clear that we do not support uh, individuals with 14C certificate that is sub minimum wage. Um, we believe in fair wages for all, and we made that very clear in our supplier code of conduct three years ago. Um, and then going back even further, you know, we also really put in uh, the contracts on accessibility obligations on accessibility as part of those as well. And it's not just having the words on the page, we then test. And I think that's really the important part of this is we, we these aren't just words, we really mean it. Uh, because we need those products to be accessible for whoever's consuming them, our employees, our customers, and both are equally important to us. 
So yeah, we really do mean it. Um, we know that that's the, uh, we're often chatting with suppliers who are like, what's, what's WCAG, what's, what's accessibility and we're, we're educating. And then we work with many that are like game on, we got it. Uh, and we're on the bus. Um, and we welcome all, um, you know, don't, don't be scared of this. Uh, just help us and, and work with us and, and we will power you. We offer training. Uh, we really do work with everyone who works with Microsoft, uh, as well as, you know, our own employees and what we produce. That's, that's just so powerful. I, I just love this, this work that you do. And I'm going to lead this into a product, a favorite product of mine that you have created. And I hope you can see it here. <laughs> the adaptive controller. Yes, it was released on GAD. I don't remember which year um, it has yeah, changed. Three or four years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has changed the industry of gaming. Uh, it, it, it allowed so many people with disabilities to game. There was an unbelievable Super Bowl commercial, which Microsoft has graciously allowed me to use in my presentations because people ask me why accessibility and that commercial does a better job than I ever could explaining why and i just love to know anything you can share about whether it's you know the process of creating it what you were thinking about as a team uh, or any of the feedback that you've gotten oh well that that was a really proud moment for all of us here you know if i think back on the journey that we've been on um the adaptive controller started as a hackathon project uh it started with a lot of 3d printing it evolved into this beautifully designed uh, product that is gorgeous to use, gorgeous to look at. So it's an equal level product that's offered at the right price point. And you know, so many components came together to power that. But I'll also say it's you know just one step in the journey. And I think we've learned a lot from it um, because there was making sure the product was designed right, tested right, had all the right feedback cannot tell you how many organizations and individuals tested this thing um, before we got it out the door. And then we went through the inclusive marketing approach um, and our marketing team really did a great job in telling the story of the evolution, but also you know how it was built and why it's so important. The great thing is that that team's gone on to produce even more. Um, she says, I just, uh, I didn't know that you'd bring that up, but this was something they produced last year, which is the Surface um, Adaptive Kit, which are stickers. They're beautiful, gorgeous stickers that you put on your laptop uh, to help you if you're blind mobility. Um, she says doing live unboxing, of course, um, but they're just wonderful, simple tactile things that you can pop onto your, um, you know, onto your laptop to help pull it out of your bag more easily, attach a lanyard to it. Um, and then last week, because I'm using it right here, the new adaptive mouse. Um, and this comes with a hub um, and comes with a bunch of buttons. And even more cool, this thing just snaps off and you can turn it from left to right-handed uh. or you can just take the little mouse piece that's the mouse and you can put in a different setting. So if you, this one's actually designed for individuals with MD and CP and it's really, I use it all the time because my hand gets a bit funky and it's just beautiful. And then these things, you're going to be able to download and print your own. Um, and so whatever tail works for you, we'll be putting those out. This is coming later this year. So, you know, the team started with an idea of the adaptive controller, which clearly is empowered gamers, 400 plus million gamers around the world. But I'll tell you now that it's evolving into a series of accessible accessories um, from stickers to mice. And I think that's the power of accessibility. You can really innovate and design gorgeous things. That is amazing. And I had seen the uh, some of these announcements on the accessories, but I'm glad that you're able to show it uh, live here. I happen to be using it. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, that's obviously useful, right? Uh, yeah. 
Um, I, I would like to invite the audience to start preparing questions so that as, as we finish, we'll take some audience questions. Um, but I'm, I'm intrigued that you had a 3D, uh, that this started as a hackathon and 3D printing. So this is an internal Microsoft hackathon or uh, can you can you speak to, yeah, to that a little no. bit more? I'm a, I'm a big fan of hacking, Joe. I, I think it's a really important thing and really on on two levels. Um, so we have an annual hackathon here at Microsoft. It's something that our CEO instilled when he became the boss uh, in 2014. And, um, you know, the great thing to know about Satya is he is such a passionate advocate for accessibility. He was actually my exec sponsor of the employee group before he became CEO. Um, but this hackathon brings together people. You basically drop your work for a week and you're given permission to go and invest in areas that you're just super passionate about um and we started the ability hack in 2014 and that first year we had about 10 projects and we hacked on things the, the one the biggest one was on eye gaze um and that's why we created the als eye gaze wheelchair that actually turned into eye control in windows down the line the next year it was immersive reader and that's uh, stuff that's for dyslexia. And that's also in all of our office products now. If you open Edge, you'll see Immersive Reader. Try it. It's super cool. And so last year, we had about, you know, for context, we went from 10 projects. We're averaging around 250 to 300 projects now, about 2,000 employees hacking on things they're passionate about. And that's where this thing came from. Wow. Um, and so it, not every hack turns into a product. Along the way, we're able to educate people on disability accessibility and all the tools available, how to code, how to uh, include people with disabilities, the principles of inclusive design, what to say, what not to say, all of that goodness gets wrapped into that process. And then we get nuggets of joy like this um, that just, uh, that's why we work, right? That's why technology is the future. I really believe it. Uh, that is just fantastic. Um, and you've really hit everything just right. When you mentioned the commercial, you know, there's lots of folks that talk about, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, inspiration porn that basically people are trying to make make folks feel inspired like people you know inspired and and these like uh cliches but i really felt that that commercial hit the tone right because it was just showing these kids are not asking for pity they're not asking to be told that they're inspiring they just want a game and that's it and your your marketing team really hit that on the nose joe i will tell them that and that will mean a lot coming from you. But yes, I do think that's important. I know we pay, and we are live. You can see that there's somebody mowing the lawn behind me if you're hearing that. Um, but it, it's a really important thing. If you're going to tell stories and you're going to share and talk about disability and accessibility, make sure it's grounded. Make sure that it's really cemented to the principles. Um, and it has to be about the product. It has to be a community voice has to be the people um it, it just it can't be inspiration porn at this point we we should be better than that um and that's just really important absolutely um i want to mention by the way i i yesterday was doing recording a webinar and uh, a helicopter i never get helicopters a helicopter <laughs> was right above me they just know that our schedule better than we do it's pretty funny um you mentioned uh, Satya Nadella. His book was fantastic. I read it and you can really see that he is committed to accessibility, which is, is really wonderful. Um, I want to give you the opportunity. Uh, you already mentioned the, uh, the peripherals. Are there any other announcements that you have for GAD or is it mostly around that that started to get announced last week? I will say that GAD has become this coalescing force at Microsoft. You know, we have, um, you know, the way that we operate at the company is that I have an incredible team of, of humans. In fact, our blog the, today, which went live just before this, 
Um, the picture on the top of the blog is actually some of the folks from our team in the brand new inclusive tech lab, which we opened last week. Um, I, but know that my team is in many ways not as important as all the other teams. We operate in a hub and spoke model. So Xbox, Windows, they have their own team. And on GAD, we all come together and we launch uh, you know, a bunch of good stuff. So I would say that there's some great information out there. Three things to maybe highlight. Um, clearly on the, on the technology side, Windows team has been doing some fantastic work uh, to really embed a lot more into the heart of Windows 11. Um, and we have just put out there uh, some new features, including live captions, which is a hot topic in the industry right now. They're available online and offline, which is really important for deaf, hard of hearing. Um, just in the product, voice assist, focus features, natural voices for screen reader users. And, and importantly, making accessibility more visible, discoverable, easy to find. I need people to be able to get to it. Xbox has also put out some great things. We are really, really, really passionate about accessible gaming. Everyone should have the ability to play. So building on the adaptive controller and uh, you know, taking that further. So we've got sign language now embedded into Forza, uh, not just American sign language, but British sign language and a new Twitch channel in partnership with Saracen um, for our deaf gamers out there. Um, and then a really important piece and study done by our education team looking at the impact of the pandemic on kids with disabilities and educational tools um, this is a big, you know, my holistic goal is to help power and bridge the disability divide. That divide has gotten bigger during the pandemic, uh, particularly in education. I'm a mom, stepmom of four, all have different needs. My youngest has autism. We felt it really heavily. Um, and so leaning into that and also leaning into hiring more and opening doors to more disabled talent. So, We've also put out the Neurodiversity Career Connector, um, which is 30 plus companies sharing resumes, basically. Uh, so apply to one of us and you apply to all of us. We're trying to make it simple, easy for people to get what they need, whether it's a job or a feature. But I will also say there's more to do, right? There is far more to do. And I think I, you know, if you're sitting on this call, you're like, I need help. Um, please contact the Disability Answer Desk. Um, please get that feature information to us and know that I'm constantly looking at the feedback uh, that's coming in because we've come a long way as an industry, but my gosh, is there a lot more to do? That is, that is simply incredible. And I have follow-up questions. However, we have, uh, we have some Q&A and I think we're gonna bring somebody on um, to ask this question. So Jillian, you want to take that? Yep. Um, I've always wanted to say this, but Daniel, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> I've just promoted you to panelists and perfect. Daniel will join us shortly. Belinda, you're still muted. There we go. Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm from the uh, state of Alaska. And I work with the PR department. I help people with disabilities find work, Oh, so I work with the VR department, excuse me. We have staff who are deaf, staff who are blind, speech disabled, multiple disabilities that work here. We have multiple different computer setups that we need for our staff, and we are dependent on captions.
Teams is great as a communication device. But as far as the, the caption placement with Zoom and with Teams, it would be nice if there was an ability to move the captions to where the speaker is. That way I'm not playing table tennis quite so much, especially if I have a present presenter. Also with the interpreter placement on the screen, it would be really nice if we could change the size and the placement of where the interpreter is and where the presenter is. So those are just a couple of feature improvements I would suggest, some feedback I've already given. I've presented that to the technical support team, but I'm waiting to hear back from them. I thought I'd take the opportunity to provide that here. So thank you for the question and, and really great feedback. I um, So again, let me just stress a couple of things. Captioning has become the utterly essential, even more so during the pandemic, um, feature across every platform, every company. And it's been incredible to see the progress and the improvements um, in really the last two years. Um, Teams captioning grew over 3,500% during the pandemic, the usage of captioning. And we were able to get it free, turned on independently and instantly on all of our products. Um, really within the couple, first couple of months of the pandemic in response uh, to the virtualization of the workforce. Um, and the accuracy is pretty good. We also have CART on there, so you can still plug in a CART provider. Um, you know, so you have options at this point, but there, there's definitely more to do. Um, and I see this as, as, as a deaf, hard of hearing person. Um, I want more. Um, and so know that your, your request is, is amplified by many. Um, and I know the team is really working on a few things. Really, you know, a couple of the key points that you pointed out, the position and customization of, capt of captioning, and also giving you the ability to independently size and position an interpreter window. So nothing to share yet, but yes, we're definitely working on that. And I would also love for you to try out the Windows captioning um, that's just been, because that is all sizable, movable, online and offline. So know that um, that one's just come out and it's in Windows Insider Build today. So thank you, thank you for the feedback, it's a great question. Thank you, Daniel, for the question. And I see that we're running out of time. So I want to give you a chance, uh, Jenny, to uh, give us some final thoughts about the, what you think the future of accessibility is or anything else that you wanted to share on these, this, the 11th GAD. I would love, my gosh, I would say really a couple of things. It's never been more important to think about accessibility, to think about the inclusion of people with disabilities. This is a growing demographic and the pandemic has added fuel to that fire. And it's really incumbent on us to get educated, to be more aware and to make sure whether you have a disability or not, that you are coding, designing, developing and writing content, even an email that is inclusive and accessible and I just also honestly want to say a huge thank you to the community for powering us. Know that I spend hours of my day listening and collating and uh, chatting with folks. That will always be the case. Um, thank you for keeping me grounded. Um, and I know that there's always more to do. Um, but really, I want to shut up because you've got one of my heroes on the call. Um, and I think you should really go there um, because I see him. Um, Mr. Coelho is on the call. So I, I think, Joe, let me just leave it by saying a huge thank you to you for starting GAD and starting this movement. Um, I know we're all, my gosh, he just waved at me. Um, we're all <laughs> in your stead. Um, so, and, and please keep the energy Thank going. you. Thank, thank you, Jenny. It was really an honor and a pleasure to have you on board. And uh, we will see you online. <laughs> 
soon. Have a happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day. <laughs> and, with, and with that, I'm going to invite Tony Coelho to join us. And I am so excited. Um, Tony has spent his entire life helping advance the lives of people with disabilities. Tony has been a six-term congressman. He was the primary author and sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act, otherwise known as the ADA. Tony advocated for the ratification of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is tremendous all by itself. He convinced President Clinton to establish the Office of Disability Empl Employment Policy at the US Department of Labor. Last but not least, Tony convinced President Obama to issue an executive order enforcing Section 503 of the Re Rehabilitation Act of 1973, requiring federal contractors and subcontractors to hire people with disabilities as they have been doing since 1973 for women and minorities. Tony, it is an absolute honor to have you join us. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it very much. I also appreciate Jenny's comments there at the end. That was nice of her. Uh, she is a, a real leader uh, for the disability community. And as she indicated, as a member of the disability community, she's very committed uh, to accessibility, which is something that, you know, I'm very aggressively involved in and trying to uh, make a difference. So we appreciate Microsoft's interest and concern, and I particularly appreciate Jenny's comments. Well, th thanks for that, Tony. But I also want to thank you for laying the foundation, um, you know, conceiving of getting the groups together to create the ADA. Uh, it, it, it was just so it just changed everything, the entire environment. And in our previous conversations, we've talked about how important it is for the disability community to come together, to be united rather than sit in silos. Would you say that that your vision came true? It came to fruition because of your efforts to bring people together for a common cause? Yes, Joe, that's right. But also because of my epilepsy, uh, as you know, I have epilepsy, uh, continue to have seizures over the last 60 years. So I'm, I'm an active person in regards to the disability community, not only in having seizures, but as a strong advocate to try to make changes. Uh, getting the groups together for the ADA was a tough one because uh, they hadn't really all worked together that much in the past. And by getting together, it really helped us uh, get something done. But as you know, uh, after we got it passed, the Supreme Court, in their infinite wisdom, I say, decided that only people with uh, severe, I mean, uh, uh, physical disabilities uh, are covered by the ADA. That was the intent. Well, you know, they're basically saying I didn't know what the heck I was doing because uh, in drafting it, we wanted to make sure that all disabilities were there. So when they did that, we decided to do something that's unusual. We decided to reverse the Supreme Court decision by uh, putting in legislation, the ADA Amendments Act, uh, that would include all people with disabilities very specifically. And we were successful. We reversed the court decision. And so now all people with disabilities are included. And that, that happened uh, uh, 20 years ago. And so uh, now what we need to do is to try to make sure that uh, things are accessible, or the internet in particular, and that's what I'm working on now. But getting the community to work together has been the issue. Why we got the ADA Amendments Act quickly uh, was because of that. And now the community is coming together in regards to uh, internet accessibility. So it's a large community, as you well know, one out of every five Americans has a disability. But then if you take their loved ones and their, their uh, people who help, uh, it's larger than that. So it's a community that can get a lot done if they get together. And that's um, something I've worked on for a long, long time and, and we're there. And more importantly, Joe, as you know, um, over 50 different countries have uh, an ADA of their own, but at least there is a world community that is understanding that those of us with, dis uh, with disabilities can be a tremendous asset uh, to uh, everyday life and every aspect of life if they only give us the opportunity 
to participate. You're right on the money on everything. And in particular, we were talking about the number of people with disabilities. The, the who was it? It was Harvard. They did a study in 2014 that over a half, sorry, over a third of the population back in 2014 were above the age of 50. And that number was growing with the boomers, right? So when you're, when you're thinking of that, it's really a much, much larger number than one in five, because if you, if you're over 50, you're not seeing the same way you did in your twenties and thirties. You're not hearing the same way. You're not moving the same way and everybody benefits from accessibility. So how can and, we expand Joe, that? One of the things that I really worked on, there's one word that I think is critical is uh, stigma. Uh, immediately when you acknowledge you have a disability or somebody sees that you have a disability that's physical, whatever, they immediately assume that you can't do things. They immediately want to reach out and help you and so forth. And it's considered a health issue when those of us with disabilities, we want to be treated like everybody else. That means giving us the opportunity to fail. If you don't give us the opportunity to fail, we can't succeed. But stigma becomes the big issue. And how do you eliminate that? The reason I bring that up is that those numbers in regards to disabilities are people who acknowledge they have a disability. And how many millions of people refuse to acknowledge because they're afraid they can't get a job. They're afraid they may be fired. They're afraid of the, the stigma in effect. And a lot of families uh, don't want their children to uh, acknowledge that they have a disability. That happened in my family where uh, people, my family thought that if you had epilepsy that you were possessed by the devil. Well, that some churches preach that uh, at, in the old days, but it's, they still do today. So stigma is still our biggest problem. And those numbers go up tremendously if everybody were honest. Wow. I'm, I'm learning a lot just chatting with you over here. Uh, this, this is incredible. Um, before going into other questions, I want to give you the opportunity to speak about what's going on right now. Um, and, and just to set the stage, the ADA was passed. I used to know this exactly, but I think it was 1990. That's um, right. July then, 26, and, by the way. <laughs> yes, July 26. Not that I remember, but that's <laughs> Um, and th the only thing was that the internet was not really that, uh, it was just kind of getting started. There weren't any mobile apps. It was long before the iPhone. And the, so the law wasn't able to really talk about digital accessibility. And this is, the courts have always been ruling in favor of uh, anybody that sued, but there was a lack of clarity in terms of the law. Um, and the Department of Justice recently provided some guidance on accessibility. Can you speak to what does it mean? First of all, any, any insight you might have as to how that came about um, and, and what kind of impact you think their guidance has and what are the next steps, if any, that, that have to happen or are being worked on? Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm going to joke a little bit here. You know, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet when we uh, did the ADA, but that's a joke. Um, the uh, internet, I've always, is part of uh, interstate commerce. ADA covers interstate commerce. Uh, you know, whatever happens, if you, if you think about what the internet does, uh, it basically prevents, uh, prevents, permits you to go ahead and do financial tr transactions. It, permits you to uh, buy things. So it is definitely involved with, with commerce. Now, I've always felt that the internet was covered by the ADA. I still feel it is covered by the ADA. Now, we tried to get um, uh, regulations adopted in the Obama administration to make clear that it under the ADA, internet uh, uh, was covered. Uh, we didn't make it at the end, uh, OMB and some others were uh, opposed because of some business interests and so forth. We didn't quite make it, but we're now back at it again. And so there are several things that are going on. Uh, the Justice Department, uh, HEW, Health and Human, uh, Human Welfare, and uh, the Education Department are all working on regulations. Now, HEW and education basically are interested in the health area and the education area. 
So those are narrow focuses uh, for them. But justice is across the board. If, when justice does it, it's everybody is then uh, required to, to uh, uh, make the internet accessible. Now, what's going on? They're, they're drafting those rules right now, those regulations, uh, making good progress uh, from everything that I know. And, uh, but it takes time. I don't think we'll get regulations until sometime next year, uh, but uh, the process is going and, and I'm optimistic that we will. Uh, in the meantime, I should let you know that 181 or disability organizations have sent a letter to the Justice Department, to the White House, and to uh, uh, US senators saying that we need to move on this and we need to move on it now. So what that means is you have 180 different disability organizations together, as we discussed just previously, working on this to make sure that people understand this is critical. Um, you know, look at during COVID, um, basically, the general population understood how important the internet was for them to accomplish uh, financial transactions and purchases and so forth because they couldn't leave their home they couldn't go to the bank they couldn't go to retail operations they couldn't even go and get food so basically they had to use the internet now if you understand that think about those of us with disabilities uh, who can't get access through the internet we struggled during COVID because we didn't have an ability to move and do things like everybody else. And so it's people now realize how critical that is for us. And so we're now uh, working to also do some legislation and we're in the final process of that in the next few weeks, uh, that'll be announced and it's extensive and so forth. But that is really uh, getting an effort to convince the White House to move, to move faster, to get this done. Ultimately, legislation would be fine. But we know with the current breakdown in, in the House and the Senate that it will be difficult to get something done in this Congress. Uh, at the end of this year, the Congress uh, adjourns and then a new Congress is established in January of 2023. So we hope at that point, depending on the makeup of the Congress, makeup of the Congress, that we can then get something done there as well. But if the rules and regulations are the best way to go, it then implies that ADA or confirms that ADA uh, is covered. Legally, what's been happening is that uh, a pizza company, in, in uh, more specifically, uh, said that they didn't have to comply, and so they sued and. Uh, they won in the lower court. It was appealed to the appellate court. They lost in the appellate court, and then they appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refused to take their, their appeal. So basically, the appellate court decision stands. Now, at the same time, they were suing in other uh, courts, and some of those decisions have been negative. So there's a mixed uh, reaction at this particular point. That's why getting these rules and regulations is critical. Um, and we have the legislation um, as well. So that's the current process that's going on. Um, I'm excited about it. I'm very involved in it. And I, I'm optimistic that we're going to get it done this time. Great. That's that's really great news. And and by the way, we just have a comment from uh, Rocio, who is uh, on the Diamond team, who's saying that uh, that pizza company uh, actually has accessibility developers now. So among <laughs> all of the fighting, they finally came out and said, you know what? Uh, I, I think they should have realized a long time ago that they'll reach more people and spend a lot less money on lawyers if they just just work on. Uh, well, a on good example on that, Joe, is that when we were doing the ADA, the company that fought us the most was Greyhound. And, and so they said, you know, they had these buses, they couldn't make them accessible and so forth and so on. My position was, look, at, if the law passes, then you're going to have companies trying to invent things to make your buses accessible. That's big money for them. And it'll happen. But we gave Greyhound and motor bus owner, owners an extension of time to comply. I think it was something like 15 years or something. It was a long time. And in the meantime, what happened? 
now buses bow and scrape and dance and do everything to permit the elderly, permit people with disabilities in power chairs or, or in chairs or whatever to get on those buses. So uh, if, if businesses will just understand that those of us in the disability community want to participate, want to be involved, uh, we want to pay taxes. I've always said to, to five of the last six presidents, and I'll leave that open as to the one I didn't, but five of the last six presidents, I've told them all the time that, look, at, there's only one group in society that I know of that wants to pay taxes. And that's those of us with a disability, because if we're paying taxes, that means we have a job. We can provide for our loved ones. We can get married. We can own a car. We can own a house. We can do everything everybody else does. But we have to have that opportunity, and that's what it's all about. Really well said. Um, I'm going to prompt, prompt some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so please, you know, think of think of your questions and place them um, in the chat. But I really, really want to understand your story. Uh, really, anything that you want to say about your journey, how you joined government, how you uh, how how you rose and were able to advocate so much, like. What is it that you take a young person today that would like to uh, advocate for whatever issue it is, but get involved in government? Um, I think I think your story is so fascinating, and I'd love for you to share whatever you're comfortable sharing. Uh, Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm happy to share anything, as I've told you and I've told others. There's no question that's too personal for me. I mean, I'm a wide open book. Um, you know, what happened is that on my uh, family's dairy farm. Uh, my brother and I milked cows every day uh, for six years, every morning, every night. But one day uh, I was in a pickup truck and uh, I was a passenger and the individual driving was going too fast. We ended up in the canal and I hit my head. I got out. Um, nothing was wrong. I continued doing uh, the work that we were doing uh, for a year, a year later. All of a sudden I was in the barn milking and the uh, only thing I know is I woke up uh, and I was in bed and I could hear people talking, but I couldn't do anything. The doctor that was there told my family that he thought I had epilepsy. Uh, at those days, the doctors didn't talk to young people. They talked to parents only. And so I was 16 at the time. And that uh, so they said that that's he said that's what it was. My family believed that if you had epilepsy, that you were possessed by the devil. And the reason for that is that the Catholic Church in 400 AD said that if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. Um, and, and other religions are the same. So I'm not uh, just stressing the Catholic Church. Uh, and so basically, my family believed that. And uh, so I went to other doctors, they told them the same thing. Then my family took me to witch doctors. And after the third one, I said no. Now, the reason I point that out is that I realized then that stigma was a problem. My families dealt with it uh, in the wrong way, of course. Uh, but these doctors, the witch doctors, I mean, and then others, the same thing. My family sheltered me from being out in public and different things. Um, but I went away to college and, um, you know, I would have these passing out spells. I didn't know what they were, but I'd have these passing out spells. And I did very well in college. But at the end of my college, I decided I wanted to become, I was not going to be a trial lawyer. I decided I wanted to become a Catholic priest because John Kennedy had gotten assassinated, given of his life to help people. And so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, when I went for my physical, uh, the doctor said, uh, uh, you have ap epilepsy. Have you ever heard the word? No, he explained it to me. And he said, well, the good news is you're 4F. You can't serve in the military. The bad news is you can't be a priest because of canon law. Well, I didn't worry about it because I had a lot of job opportunities. I filled out the application and so forth, but I never got a job, never even got an interview. And so I realized again that stigma was a problem. Um, I got drunk every day because I thought my church, my God, my family had all turned against me. And so the day I was going to do the dirty deed, um, I uh, heard a voice and said, uh, you're not, you, you, there was a merry go round at the bottom of the hill, said, you're going to be just like those little kids. You're never going to let anybody or anything stop you from doing what you want to do. I've never gotten drunk since then. Um, I've never been depressed since then. 
I got my mojo back. And within a couple of weeks, I got an opportunity to live with Bob Hope and his family. Um, and Mr. Hope was absolutely fabulous to me. He became uh, a mentor to me. And he one day he said, um, you know, Tony, you think you have a ministry and don't even practice in the church. A true ministry is practiced in sports and entertainment and business and government. But you belong in politics. Well, I never felt that. I guess I was in politics, in government, in school and so forth. But I never thought of real politics. So I wrote a letter to my congressman, got a job, and I'm moving quickly through this, got a job, and my congressman became like a father to me. And he, I'd have seizures, um, and it didn't uh, bother him. He knew I was going to come out of it, and so forth and so on. And I've had seizures uh, these whole uh, last 64 years, and I still have them. Still I had some just recently. Um, but he was so supportive of me, and when he retired, he wanted me to run in this place. I got elected. Lucky, I'm very fortunate uh, that I had these opportunities, uh, but I worked hard at making sure that I could succeed. And when I ran for Congress, my opponent tried to use my epilepsy against me. The public reacted negatively. I was easily elected. And then when I got to Congress, I realized that we needed to amend the law to permit us in regards to housing and transportation and so forth. But then I realized we didn't have our basic civil rights. And if you don't have your basic civil rights, these laws don't mean anything. If you went to a restaurant, you were sight impaired and you asked somebody to read the menu, they could kick you out because you were a nuisance. If you went to a movie theater and you were in a chair, a power chair or a regular chair, uh, they could kick you out because you're a fire hazard or a nuisance. On and on and on, a job, a, a, an employer could ask you if you had an epilepsy and deny you a job if you wouldn't answer. And if you did answer, they would deny you and nothing, there was nothing illegal in regards to that. So that's how we went about the ADA. Reagan was president. He was working on it with a group that he had and uh, I worked with them. And not realizing, by the way, that there was this tremendous grassroots out there trying to get something done. And after I introduced the bill and so forth, I then started meeting with these people and we modified the bill in the next Congress and we got it passed. Uh, but what I would tell the young people, believe in whatever you wanna believe in, but don't give up. Um, I had a lot of folks say, you can't do this because of that, because of whatever. And that still happens to me, but I, I, I'm driven, you know, and one, I'll just one quick story, and I hope I don't we run out of time, but one quick story. One of my big concerns was when I was in the Congress and I was the House whip, I got to take a trip to different countries with a delegation, and I wanted to go to the Vatican to meet the Pope. And so uh, they arranged that. We get there. We're at the Vatican. We're sitting down. The Pope comes in. We all stand up. I have to go to the podium and speak. Now, I take a position that a podium is any time you have a group of people that are listening to you. It's not a wooden thing or a steel thing. It is you have a control of the, the crowd. So at the podium, I read this very boring pre-approved speech by the Vatican and the State Department. I got through with it, and I said, Your Holiness, I cannot live with myself if I uh, didn't say something personal. Now, his minions around the room were going, bah, bah, bah. my delegation was looking at me as if I was crazy because I told no one I was going to do this. And I said, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't say something personal. When I was a young man, I decided I wanted to become a Catholic priest. Uh, I was denied entry because of my epilepsy. And canon law established in 400 AD said that if you have epilepsy, you're possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. I think that's very unchristian of our church, and I wish you'd look into it. So after he did his very boring speech, we took a lot of pictures. Um, my wife and I walk him to the door. He's holding her hand. When he gets to the door, he turns around and blesses her. He turns to me and does not bless me. As a Catholic, that's not something that you want to see happen. But he didn't bless me. He, but he did say, young man, I heard your comments. He turned around and walked away. Now, I thought I was going to go straight to hell, by the way, because I'm not blessing me. But... I was satisfied because I said what I had to say. I believe in speaking up to power. And so that was it. Two years later, I heard that canon law had been changed to permit people with epilepsy to become priests. Now, I want to make sure all your folks understand 
that I'm not taking credit for that. I'm only taking credit for the fact that I stood up and said what I believe. I don't know what made them change. Um, maybe my comments did, but anyhow, it was changed. That's what's important. And uh, so that's my journey. Um, I am devoted to making a difference for our community. I have not stopped, will not stop. Uh, just because I'm 80 doesn't mean that I don't have a few more years to keep doing it, and I intend to. Wow. <laughs> we actually are out of time, however, so I'm, I apologize to the folks that uh, have that Q&A, but that, that blew me away. Uh, it, is, it is extremely, as somebody that does plenty of pub public speaking, I can only think of one instance where I had to say something really unpopular to a room. It felt very uncomfortable. It was probably the worst speech I've ever given. And it wasn't in front of the Pope. So uh, kudos to you, kudos to everything that, that you've done. Thank you so much for it. And I want to leave you uh, some final thoughts about what's coming up in the future and just anything general that you want to add. Well, I think the one thing is, is to try to get this uh, executive order or regulations in regards to the internet thing. And in my view, that issue is as important as the ADA itself. Uh, it's millions of people uh, that it impacts. And, and uh, as Jenny was saying about uh, captioning and, and accessibility and so forth, Microsoft understands this. Apple understands it because in all their products, they're accessible in all kinds of different ways. And so it is something that has to be done. That's the thing that I'm most involved in. And I, as you know, Joe, I've started a Quello Disability Center at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And I'm really committed to making a lot of these things happen. So thank you for having me on. Thank you so much, Tony. This was an incredible hour. Uh, I, I, I'm thrilled. And I hope that we can uh, invite you on again in the future, if you're willing. And maybe I won't talk as much and there can be some questions. No, I'd love you. I'd love you to talk as much as you like. It was fantastic. So thanks again. Happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day to you. Thank you to the audience for showing up. And uh, I hope we see lots of wonderful changes just as you were, were talking about, Tony. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Happy Gad, everyone.